This is Thinking to Think, the critical thinking podcast where we analyze topics such as civics, history, culture, philosophy, politics, and current events through a critical thinker's lens. I am your host, the social studies educator, Michael Antonio Aponte, also known as Mr. A. Every Sunday, we will have a new episode within these topics, as well as occasional special guests and recorded lectures with my students. So please subscribe, share, listen, and let's build a critical thinking society together. Everything about this episode will be referenced in the details in the podcast because I feel this subject has a tendency to be taken either out of context or trigger people due to lack of knowledge. This lecture is modified from a chapter of my book on uh, chapter on socialism. And I want to start this episode with a quote by William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. What's in a name that which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet? There is a distinction between socialism depending on who you're talking to. When I was an undergrad at Queens College, the City University of New York, I pondered over the fine distinctions between democratic socialism and communist socialism. See, my major study was philosophy. So I, it was pushed onto me to read and critically analyze the European philosophers of Plato, Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche, Immanuel Kant, George William Frederick uh, Heigl, uh, John Stuart Mill, William James, and John Dewey. I also took a special interest and studied the Asian Eastern philosophies such as Lao Tzu, Confucius, Buddha, uh, Kogugaku, and Rangaku. Nevertheless, I had some ideas of socialism and many, not all, of my professors who didn't teach me critical thinking or logical strategies taught me how great this idea of socialism was. Unfortunately for those professors who preached rather than teach, my first and one of my most impactful classes happened to be critical thinking by a professor who made us write papers and analyze different topics and details. We were encouraged for our papers to use causality, uh, cause and effect, and determine conditions if certain things were different, so probability. But many people know the meaning of socialism to some extent, but not the understanding or differences of the types of social socialism that are out there. Socialism is actually both an economic term and a political ideology. It creates an equal distribution and in most instances, equal outcome. That's from the Merriam dictionary, uh, uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary, excuse me, defines it as, one, any of uh, various economic and political theories advocating collective or governmental ownership and administration of the means of production and distribution of goods. Two, a system of society or group living in which there is no private property. To be a system or condition of society in which the means of production are owned and controlled by the state. Three, a stage of society in Marxist theory tra transitional between capitalism and communism and distinction uh, distinguished by unethical distribution of goods and pay accordance to work done. Wow. This and this is the simplistic definition and is, is much more complex than what it appears, believe it or not. There are actually different forms of socialism. Form, from an economic standpoint, the major differences between socialism and capitalism is that socialism is about the collective and capitalism is about the individuals. I warn you not to judge the two if you do not understand the statement you just read.
I warn you not to judge the two if you do not understand what I just said. Let me elaborate. Socialism takes it a step further. According to the Corporate Finance Institute, here are some of the differences. We have democratic socialism. In democratic socialism, factors of production are under the management of an elected administration. Vital goods and services such as energy, housing, and transit are distributed through market systems to planning, while a free market system is used to distribute consumer products. Revolutionary socialism. The running philosophy of revolutionary socialism is that a socialistic system can't emerge while capitalism is still in play. Revolutionaries believe that the road to a purely socialistic system requires a lot of struggle. In such a system, the factors of production are owned and ran by workers through a well-developed and centralized structure. Then there's libertarian socialism works on the assumption that people are always rational, self-determining, and autonomous. If capitalism is taken away, people naturally turn to a socialistic system because it is able to meet their needs. Then there's market socialism. The production process is under the control of ordinary workers. The workers decide how resources should be distributed. The workers sell off what is in excess or give it out to the members of the society who then distribute resources based on a free market system. And then there's the green socialism. Protective of natural resources, uh, sources, large corporations in a green socialist uh, society are owned and ran by the public. In addition, green socialism promotes the development and use of public transportation as well as the processing and sale of locally grown food. This production is process is focused on ensuring that every member of the community has enough access to basic goods. Moreover, the public is guaranteed a suitable wage. That's um, the green socialist would probably be your Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, whereas the um, Bernie Sanders would be the democratic socialist. And they were in odds in the beginning, but I'll get to that and I'm digressing. But nevertheless, these forms of of economic phrases are part of a planned economy. Think of it as it was discussed and planned as a society to develop the goods or service to its people. There are significantly more terms of socialism, but some of the advantages in theory is that each worker in the community has a say on how the resources are managed and it uses the skill of the workers to the most advantage. However, the most disadvantage uh, to socialism, and this would be key in our examples, is dependency on cooperation within the community, cooperation, excuse me, within the community and lack of competitiveness and innovation. In other words, the trust and drive of individuals, the same advantage Advantages and disadvantages can be the ideology of socialism. Socialism ideology can be very different based on who you ask. See, socialism began with the utopian socialism by Robert Owen, uh, Henry de Saint uh, Sim Simone, and Charles Fourier, who influenced Karl Marx, the creator of the popular Marxism. Around the same time of the rise of Marx came communism, which believes in socioeconomic structured ideas for common ownership thanks to the classless and stateless social organization. Many have argued that socialism is not communism, but it was Lenin who declared that the goal of socialism is communism. And trust me, I will get to Lenin momentarily. Maoism from Mao Zedong, believed that class struggle is always ongoing throughout the society that must continuously be vigilant. 
And according to Mao, he believed political power comes from the barrel of a gun. Vote for me or there'll be continuous riots, there'll be continuous violence type of deal. Or let me lead you. Autonomous is a different form of socialism and Marxism, uh, which is less focused with a party political organization and more focused on self-organized action against a traditional organizational structure. Autonomous. In other words, workers are autonomous and encourage socialization in the workplace and slow working conditions. The conditions on actual productivity is less while having higher resistance to capitalism. See, anarchists is arguably the most romanticized form of socialism. Anarchist socialists advocates this with stateless societies. Your defund the police, your, you know, no more government. They hold the idea of a state to be harmful and undesirable to people. This form of government, and ironically, since they do not believe in the state, was tested in the Spanish Civil War in the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. Anarchist socialists in Russia supported and took part in the communist Bolsheviks uh, revolution. Soon after, however, the Bolsheviks turned against them. See, this led to the uh, Krastadar uh, rebellion. I could be butchering the name. I do apologize. But this rebellion happened in 1921. And many survivors fled to Ukraine. Ironically, the anarchists continued to fight the whites, as what is called. Uh, they were opponents of the revolution. The whites and the reds were the revolutionists. Despite being betrayed by the Bolsheviks, other attempts have existed in different times in Europe, but never was able to take roots. Furthermore, this experiment was attempted again in the United States during the protests in June of 2020 when the protesters declared a section of Seattle, Washington as a Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, also known as CHAZ, which later became uh, the Capitol Hill Organized Protest, CHOP, due to, ironically, legality. There are different forms of anarchists that combine other features but do not always agree with one another. And the list goes as follows. Mutualism, collective, collectivist anarchism, anarcho-communism, anarcho-syndicalism, and individualist anarchism. I hope you're still with me on this. Now, the democratic socialism, on the other hand, has been discussed in great detail in the Western Hemisphere. It is a very broad meaning that is different for anyone who just hears it, as Bernie Sanders says in a Saturday Night Live skit, hugely different, like huge. This difference is huge, but doesn't go into specifics. This evidence was very clear during the political debates uh, from 2016 to 2020. Representatives such as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Bernie Sanders are examples of both declared, to some extent, democratic socialists and yet have completely different definitions of what that means. In essence, the more centrist idea is a mixed economy, a combination of planned economy and a free market. They also, commit, uh, they also committed to the ideas of redistribution of wealth and power. However, the more left-leaning democratic socialists are, the more they support a socialist system through revolutionary or evolutionary, also known as reform, nor, uh, reform means, Karl Marx's idea of capitalism is the first step to socialism. There are different ideas of democratic socialism, and many argue it has not been done before. However, the first declared democratic socialist that succeeded in South America was Venezuela by Hugo Chavez. Unfortunately for the people of Venezuela, it became a disaster. The most privileged country in South America became one of the poorest and regulated countries within 20 years. Chavez and his Bolivian revolution 
redistributed wealth as promised, which led to the downfall of the middle and upper class who owned the business businesses and most productivity. The lower class did enjoy some prosperity, though, until the funds ran out. How I believe it was Margaret, Margaret that, uh, Thrasher that said uh, um, the problem with socialism, socialism is that you run of you run out of other people's money. Um, now, Venezuela is in control by President uh, Nicolas Maduro, who lost an election but declared that it was rigged and stayed in office. My mother's side of the family has relatives in Venezuela today who are under strict rules by the policies of Maduro. Many people argue that he took office from Chavez after his death, but forgot that it was Chavez who appointed Maduro in several key positions of power, the same way as Lenin did with Stalin. The Wall Street Journal claimed he was, and this is to Maduro, the most capable, and I quote this, the most capable administrator and politician of Chavez's inner circle. There are significant more forms of socialism, such as libertarian socialism, eco-socialism, and liberal socialism. But for the sake of this episode, due to its length, let's focus on the dangers of not understanding what you claim to support. And it is the lack of understanding that has led to the misinformation that we see in our educational system, our media, and our policies today. Most people... <laughs> Most people's heads would explode, figuratively speaking, of course, if I was to tell them that the Nazi party was founded as a form of socialism. The term Nazi is an acronym in German, which translates in English as National Socialist German Workers Party. Yes, you heard this correctly. The Nazi party was marketed as a socialist party. Originally condemned, condemning and banning and, um, and being banned in Germany for years prior to its control, this form of national socialism created a rise of support from the 1920s to 1940s. And around this time, Hitler was arrested for an attempted coup to overthrow the government. Hitler was never even elected in the elections of 1932, but the president of the German Republic at the time, Paul von Heidenberg, named him chancellor in January 1933 due to his popularity. However, due to the burning of the Reichstag, uh, Hitler received emergency powers, which gave the power to the Nazis that we know of today. Its root of socialism and anger towards an unjustified system was the catalyst to produce the authoritarian nation that sparked World War II. However, Hitler and the Nazi party needed support of major corporations, which defeats the ideas of socialism, which is the reason they're not considered by historians socialists. This alternative right or alt-right movement led to a genocide of people against uh, who are Jewish by the millions because they were perceived as an evil race, quote. According to the propaganda, major companies we know today became part of this movement and supported the Nazi party financially or with products. Some of the companies that I'm going to list are as follows. Nestle, Bayer, Barclays Bank, Deutsche Bank, Chase National Bank, now known as J.P. Morgan Chase, IBM, BMW, Hugo Boss, Mercedes-Benz, Porsche, and Volkswagen. Ironically, this history is being repeated today with companies such as Disney, the NBA, and Google compromising their ethics for communist countries known for unethical forced labor in order to have access to their population and markets. The Soviet Union, on the other hand, used communism instead of nationalism. This form of socialism used, Karl, used by Karl Marx, ironically German, and his communist manifesto in order to influence Vladimir uh, Lenin 
and begin to build up his followers. Now, Lenin was not only revolutionist, but became the, but he also became the victor. Um, but, but why do, why did the former Tsars of Russia have a revolution that led to the Soviet Union? That's the that's the question. What happened? Well, the simple answer was poverty. In the early 1900s, Russia was one of the poorest countries. It industrialized late in comparison to the European nations, but it was at the end of World War I that led to the beginning of the end for the royal family. After Lenin's return from exile, the October Revolution went into full swing, which led to the creations of the Bolsheviks' establishment of the Soviet Union, commonly referred to as the Soviet Union. What shortly, what happened shortly, uh, what happened shortly after receiving power that would lead to a devastation in the millions that rivals the Nazi party. Approximately half a year into its power, the Bolsheviks created a secret police to secure their revolution by weeding out, executing or punishing those considered to be enemies of the people. This is from Lenin, not Stalin. This policy was historically called the Red Terror. This was a major fire that started a civil war between the Bolsheviks and the counter-revolutionists. The Bolsheviks were considered the Reds, and the counter-revolutionists, as I said earlier, were the Whites. Despite the fact that the civil war resulted in the deaths and suffering of millions of people, regardless of which side you were on, the Red Army triumphed, but the enemies of the people were still a danger to the party, according to them. So the Bolsheviks, led by Lenin, began tribunals against enemies of the people and executed the Tsar and the Romanov family. Furthermore, the now Communist Party began indoctrination and cultural revolution by using different symbols, such as a hammer and sickle with the red background symbolizing the October Revolution. That's what it means, banning all religions and the uh, persecution of the Russian Orthodox Church and the creation of the communist uh, uh, messianism. Messianism? I could be um, saying it wrong, but it's basically portraying communist leaders similar to religious figures. And Lenin not only created these policies, but appointed Joseph Stalin to a position of authority. And many historians argue that Stalin was not a true socialist and was simply obsessed with power. Yet Lenin, prior to his death, expressed conflict over Stalin's politics. Nevertheless, Lenin did not remove him from power. And upon his death, Stalin took control and assassinated all his rivals in order to secure his reign. This is extremely common in in revolutions and communist, um, communist, especially within communism in history. But between Lenin and Stalin, the millions of people that had to die in order to create an equity of wealth was in the millions. The Gulag Archipelago, in which the ideas began with Lenin, created a harsh forced labor camp system for purging any political enemies of the state. This also created a new source of labor for the Soviet Union. It is unclear what's the exact number of deaths in total, but between the Red Terror, um, which was in 1918, 1922 by Lenin and uh, Trotsky, the Great Terror, also known as the Great Purge, 1936 to 1938 by Stalin, the gulags, and the famine that followed after redistribution because they didn't know how to farm. So they had to take all the farm, uh, all the food from the farmers because of redistribution. The amount is somewhere in the tens of millions. The Chinese Revolution had a very similar turn of events as the Soviets the Soviet Union, but the death toll was closer to 100 million. Due to the fact that the Chinese Communist government is still in charge, 
it is more difficult to gather those facts compared to the Soviet Union that has was that was that has fallen back um, in 1992. Um, and although the political party operates as a small group, they choose a leader to rule. And many communist systems elect their officials from a pool of selected members from the communist party. In the end, it is considered a democratic system. You are choosing who the party prefers to lead. But but you have to wonder, what about the other forms of socialism You know that people talk about? The Nordic model, for example. The Nordic model has been admired today by the American Democratic Socialists for years. One country in particular that tried socialism without a revolution or evolution would be Sweden. Originally uh, started in the 1930s prior to World War II, Sweden's union institution had a significant political influence, which eventually led to more socialism politics, ironically called social, social democrats. By the early 1980s, Sweden, like the other Nordic nations, began to economically decline. In particular, the welfare state was in a major decline and changes needed to occur. One was socializing the ownership of industry and the other was embracing private capital. In the end, the economic crisis ended in the 1990s by reducing government budget, deregulations, and privatization of public services. They became capitalists. And as of August 2020, which of the airing of this episode, um, just uh, under two months. Sweden holds a 74.9 rating on the economic freedom uh, scale. It's a capitalist scale, while the United States holds a 76.6. So in translation, Sweden is more in line with the United States in economic ideology. An honorable mention of a country who is false, falsely defined as a democratic socialist would be sweet, uh, Switzerland, excuse me, who ranks at an 82 on the economic freedom scale, making it more capitalist than the United States. So capitalism, let's take it, let's, uh, let's redirect to capitalism now. Known for its evil in academia, it is a free market system. In short, the power of goods and services are given directly by the demand of the people who are willing to purchase. The ownership and production is usually private. It is up to the individual to decide what is in demand and what is supplied. This supply and demand dictates price. This is where many people become agitated with capitalism. Not everyone can afford prices for certain goods. Moreover, many capitalists have made monopolies where they not only control the supply, but also the prices and level of entry to compete. This is the complication that many argue since the creation of capitalism. And to its credit, however, the United States has made laws against this practice, but some argue it's not enough. Moreover, the treatment of labor has been with mixed praises and resentment depending on the company itself. So, for example, when Microsoft uh, first became a publicly traded company as a As bonuses, they offered employees shares, commonly known as stocks, to its staff. This move not only gave investable interest in the company, 10,000 of its original employees, 10,000 of its original employees became millionaires. Tesla Motors did something equivalent to Microsoft and as of this um, as of this podcast is showing promising results that almost resemble what Microsoft went through. So what does the history tell us regarding socialism and capitalism? What is taught about socialism in academia? And 
you have to ask these questions because many young minded individuals claim to be socialists, but very few could not answer the question on what type of socialists, let alone understand what they are really promoting. It is not their fault either. They are not taught the bloody history of what it takes to maintain socialism. Socialism requires absolute trust of the collective. Also, depending on the type of socialist you may be, you may conflict with other types of socialists, which can end in bloodshed or being used for another gain. Just like the example I said earlier regarding the Bolsheviks and the, and the anarchists. So can you confidently say you trust everyone in your community and in your country that they will perform equal to how you would perform with the same exact ethics? In Russia, high school students are taught to read and study the Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. The reason is to teach their youth the dark history of their country. Something we should embrace instead of trying to erase and forget. If socialism is forced, even with good intentions, always ends in bloodshed. It begs to wonder at what cost do you plan to do this experiment? If, you, if your answer is it has never been tried before, then you haven't been paying attention. Maybe the answer is somewhere in the middle, a mixed economy. Maybe. Or maybe the answer is found in an unspecified 1970s Moscow joke that says, what would happen if the communists occupied the Sahara? Nothing for the first 50 years, then there will be a shortage of sand. Here's my personal belief, which resonates with uh, Lebanese American scholar Nassim Nicholas Tlaib, in which he wrote in his book, Skin in the Game, I am at the Fed level, libertarian, at the state level, Republican, at the local level, Democrat, and at the family and friends level, a socialist. And if that saying doesn't convince you of the fatuousness of left versus right labels, nothing will. Thanks for listening to Thinking to Think with Mr. A. If you like our show and want to know more, check out my website in the description or please leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, whichever platform you heard this episode. Please do not forget to share and spread the word. Join us next week where we will continue the fight to build a critical thinking society. Thank you and have a beautiful week.